Newsflash, it's nothing amazing, it's nothing unique, it's nothing brave, it's already happening, they are behind on the times. But anyways, you know what, small changes, it's fine. So stupid. It's Rose and welcome back to Cheap Lazy Vegan and another mukbang. Woo! I have a Korean feast in front of me. We have two different kinds of Korean dishes. Korean glass noodles, aka chapche, one of my favorite things in the world. And then we also have some kimchi fried rice. Hi! I am obsessed with these two dishes. They are so delicious. So simple as well, especially the kimchi fried rice. Literally, you can make this in like five minutes. The chapche takes a little bit longer. It's a bit more complicated. This is my mom's chapche. Well, she's the one that seasoned it, and then I just added some vegetables. I'm just gonna dig in because, oh my gosh. Whew, I don't even know what I'm gonna talk about today, guys. The last mukbang I filmed, I like went on a bit of a rant. So maybe today we'll keep it a little light. I'm not sure. All right, so this is Korean glass noodles. This is actually made of sweet potato starch, although it doesn't taste anything like sweet potato. Mmm. Mm. You guys, it's so good. Mm. I added bell pepper. Super sweet and delicious. Oh my god. That is good. Now let's have a bite of kimchi fried rice. Mm. Oh, this is a classic. Oh my God. This is so good. Mm. I have to have more kimchi. Mm. Just gonna drink some water. Now guys, some people ask me, especially when I first went vegan, some people were like, how are you going vegan? Like, you're Korean, you know? You're Korean, how are you gonna eat vegan food? As if being vegan and being Korean are mutually exclusive. And people just like assume that because you're Korean, you know, you just cannot live without animal products, which is kind of weird because so much of Korean food is actually not reliant on animal products. I've talked about this before, but a lot of Korean food is extremely easy to veganize. So these two dishes right here are normally traditionally not vegan, okay? Usually japchae has some meat, like beef or something, and then kimchi uh, generally is made of, there's some fish paste in kimchi, and also sometimes like people put egg in the kimchi fried rice or something. So yeah, generally these dishes are not vegan, but it's so easy to veganize. You know, you just have to make a few alterations. Mm. Mm. I have smoked tofu in here. Mm. I'm trying this thing where I try to slow down my eating. It's so hard. But I really feel like I need to slow down my eating. I eat really, really fast. It's hard, I don't know why. I just keep shoving food in my mouth. So. I think the reason why a lot of people were like, how are you Korean and how are you vegan? Is because like veganism is seen as this like very white, 
westernized thing. It is kind of like a new thing that has been made popular by more affluent societies in the Western world, if you will. So I get why people are thinking that. But if you look at some of the most advanced vegetarian style cuisines, you have Indian food and you also have Buddhist cuisine, like Buddhist people, especially like Buddhist monks, generally eat a very vegan friendly diet or a vegetarian diet. By the way, kimchi recipe linked below. Even though like, I guess the concept of veganism is kind of a Western thing. I think that Asian cuisine is actually some of the most advanced in terms of vegan food. <laughs> Maybe I'm just Asian, so I'm just a bit like, hi, Asian cuisine is the best. I feel like this is I've talked about this before but it's my theory back in the day especially in places like Korea or something it wasn't super rich you know there wasn't uh, a lot of money flowing around so people you know used whatever they could whatever they could find to make food a lot of it was not animal products when you go to Korea there's so many different types of dishes so many uh, different plants that are used and some of these plants, I don't even think they like have a name for it in, you know, outside of Korea. Korean people also like to eat like random plants from like mountains. They like, you know, dig up random plants and they make it into something, make it into like a side dish. There's a lot of creativity when it comes to Korean cuisine and I'm sure other kinds of like Asian cuisine as well. And I think that, you know, when you don't have a lot, you are kind of like forced to be creative. And that's why a lot of, in my opinion, this is my theory, that's why in a lot of kind of less affluent countries, the cuisine is quite developed. Flavors are just there. Mm. This is so flavorful. By the way, if you come to my cafe in Calgary, Canada, you can eat this chapta. It's so good. Mm. Mm. Also, mm. cheers. <laughs> I think that we are very attached to our food. Food is more than just food, right? We are so attached to our food. Same with me, you know? We are emotionally very attached to this food. We associate food with memories, our culture. And I think that's one of the big reasons why a lot of people have a hard time going vegan because they think that they need to basically lose a piece of their identity. Because they have this emotional attachment to food, it makes it more difficult to uh, let go of it. I was the same way. For me, the first thought, when I even thought about going vegan, was like this idea that I had to like let go of so much of my identity and my culture and 
all the foods that I was so attached to because I'm such a foodie and I always have been and I think I have a lot of emotional attachment to food so I was so scared I was like oh my god do I have to let go of all of my favorite foods essentially the answer is no I guess in a sense like I'm lucky because my culture is Korean food and a lot of Korean food like I said is quite easy to veganize mm. but I think I think most food is relatively easy to veganize have like a, some, some sort of a vegan, a vegan option I think it's the foods that are like just straight up like boiled egg or like steak. Like those are the things that are like obviously really hard to veganize. But if it's like a dish like, why can't I grab food? If it's like a dish like fried rice or spaghetti, some sort of pasta dish, like those things we can veganize it and veganize it well. Mm. What I will say is I really don't think I've lost any part of my identity I've just gained a new perspective And a new sense of identity I don't feel any less Korean or any less Canadian than I did before If you try to look at it from a negative perspective and think, oh my god, I'm giving up all this food, I have to let go of my culture, then yeah, you might feel that way, but you have to look at it from a different light, you know? There's so much amazing food. What can I do? What can I veganize? How can I make this into a vegan dish? How can I enjoy vegan food, but also enjoy an aspect of my culture? Mm. Remember that like every vegan now, most vegans come from a culture of animal products. Unless they were born vegan, which is very, very few people, most people come from a culture of animal products. So, you know, it's not just Koreans, it's not just Germans, it's not just Americans, it's not just Chinese people that are attached to animal products from their cuisine. It's almost every single culture out there. But we can't keep using culture as an excuse to keep doing something terrible, you know? Mm. Culture is not a justification for doing something awful. You know, what about slavery? That was a part of people's cultures at some point, right? 
We wouldn't say that that was a good thing, that we should continue that. You know, we have to evolve. We don't have to keep every aspect of culture that is negative. Culture is not an excuse to excuse inhumane behavior. Back when I was really young, probably like early teens or something, I used to like look at, I used to like argue with, I don't know where I argued with these people, but I remember arguing one time with somebody online about dog eating. So obviously we know that in Asia, in countries like China or Korea, there's still uh, dog meat. Okay, I'm not sure how popular it is anymore. I'm not sure how big it is, but I know it still exists. It's still there, it's still out there. And um, I remember when I was like really young, like 13 or 14, I would look at these people that were obviously anti-dog eating. They were fighting for the rights of these dogs. And I would just think, how hypocritical of you, how hypocritical of you to sit there and judge another culture for eating dogs when you are sat there eating chickens and cows and pigs. You just had a burger for lunch and now you are protesting against dog meat just because they are of a different culture, you think that you are right even though you are being a complete hypocrite. Now, I thought that at that time and even at that young age, I guess I realized the hypocrisy of someone bashing another group because you know they thought they were better or whatever but at that time my flawed mindset was we shouldn't judge someone else's culture because we are simply different or something like that and i think i remember thinking the only people that actually can say something are vegans or not vegans i don't even think i knew what a vegan was i think i thought like the only people that can actually rightfully say something without being a hypocrite would be vegetarians because they don't eat any of those animals but it would be hypocritical for us to sit there and judge some other cultures for eating another animal that we love simply because we love that animal and we don't understand their culture now obviously i'm i'm against all of that i don't think culture is an excuse to justify behavior so i wouldn't agree with my 13 year old self there but i do agree with my 13 year old self in a sense like it is hypocritical for people to judge somebody else's culture when they are literally sitting there eating a burger it still it still surprises me and shocks me how many people are super against dog meat yet they cannot see the hypocrisy when they eat a steak you know because They are culturally attached to steak, but they're not culturally attached to dog meat. They are programmed to think of dogs as friends and cows and chickens and pigs as food. They don't realize they've been programmed because if they realized that they were programmed to think of certain animals as food and certain animals as friends, then they would realize that in other cultures, clearly there's a different kind of programming where, you know, certain animals, different kinds of animals are seen as food. But morally and ethically speaking, it's all equal. It's easy also when you are in like that Western world to fight against dog meat. Why? Because everyone else around you loves dogs and never would eat a dog and it's not normal to eat a dog, but eating cows and chickens and pigs is normal, and it's in the majority, which is why people feel comfortable being a complete hypocrite, because everyone else is also a complete hypocrite when it comes to that, you know? More adopted. Mmm. Mmm. That was way too big of a bite. So 
I guess in conclusion, the one thing that I learned throughout my years is that whilst culture is not an excuse for shitty behavior, we should also look at ourselves too. I think it's very easy to judge another culture and look at what another culture is doing because we're looking at it from an outsider's perspective, right? So when I see dog meat, even though I am Korean, I grew up in Canada, so I have a very strong attachment to dogs as well. I had a dog, I would never even think about eating dogs. So I can look at, you know, a country that eats dogs and think like, that's barbaric, that's disgusting, because I'm looking at it from an outsider's perspective. So I'm looking at that and judging it. It's almost like an objective perspective in a way. But what's hard to do is be within that system, within that environment where it's normal and then take your brain out of that environment and judge it for what it is, which is what most people lack the ability to do, which is why it's easy to look at somebody else's culture and say, that's effed up, you shouldn't be doing that. But it's so much harder to look at yourself and think, oh, what about this? Like, what about what I'm doing? What about what everyone around me is doing? We can easily judge somebody else, but it's so hard to judge ourselves and think, okay, maybe I should change, <laughs> you know? Before you go protesting at the anti-dog meat festival, please look at yourself in the mirror, look at your own culture. Let's change something from within first because that's a little bit more difficult. People always turn to very kind of easy things to pick on, right? Like fur, for example. Mm. It's very easy to be anti-fur nowadays because most people are anti-fur. Fur is kind of not that trendy, you know? But for some reason, people have missed the memo and did not realize that fur and leather are pretty much the same damn thing, just from different animals. Once again, You know why it's easy to be anti-fur? Because fur is not as popular as leather is. It's not as widespread as leather is. It's not as difficult to give up as leather is. It's easy to be anti-fur when you don't already wear freaking fur. It's easy to be anti-dog meat when you don't eat dog meat. But it's not easy to be anti-cow meat because you already eat cow meat. It's not easy to be anti-leather because you already own a leather jacket, leather wallet, leather shoes. Everything around you is leather. So whatever is convenient is what people are against. But whenever it is time to step up and be like, okay, let me make a change. People find it really difficult, which I understand. But at the same time, if you expect other people to change, how come you don't expect yourself to change? If you've already changed, good for you, but you know. Mm -hmm. You guys know that I'm all about small changes. I don't think that the world is ever gonna change overnight. I think that small changes are extremely important, but I also believe in talking about the real issues. The whole fur thing really just gets to my nerves because so many of these like high fashion brands are like praised for being like, oh, we finally got rid of fur, even though it's 2019, okay? Took you freaking this long to get rid of fur? <sighs> But anyways, you know what, small changes, it's fine. So stupid. Finally, they get rid of fur and then they're praised for it. It's like they've done something so amazing to get rid of fur in 2019. Newsflash, it's nothing amazing. It's nothing unique. It's nothing brave. It's already happening. They are behind on the times. I get it. We should be supportive. I get it. But let's talk about leather then. They're all still selling leather. They are all still selling and promoting leather. Every single one of those high-end bags are made of leather. 
So you tell me, what is the progress? You've just eliminated one aspect of cruelty, but you still sell a major, major cruel product in all of your products. I don't know why I decided to start talking about this, but it really gets to my skin, guys. It really, really gets to me. It's like, do we forget the leather is from an animal too? Also, you know, people online, beauty gurus or whatever, they like wear like a faux fur jacket and they're like, guys, don't worry, it's faux fur. And then 20 minutes later, they bring out a leather bag. I'm like, <laughs> did we forget that that is also an animal? It's like we just don't care about cows. It's like cows are just lifeless beings that are not sentient, even though they are. Like I said, it's easy to be anti-fur. It's not easy to be anti-leather. But, guess what? You can still be anti-leather. If you still find it really difficult to let like, go of leather, please buy it secondhand. I actually believe in buying secondhand leather. I actually do. I would actually buy secondhand leather. Why? Because overall, in terms of the amount of damage we could do, first of all, the, the damage has been done. So throwing it away causes more damage to the environment, right? I try to look at things from like a utilitarian perspective. Is that the right word? Like what action is going to do the greatest amount of damage or the greatest amount of good. And when you're looking at something like a leather jacket that's already produced, it's already created, it's already bought. This leather jacket, when it's a secondhand leather jacket, it's already a sunk cost, as in it's already been created, it's already been sold. The profit has already gone to the leather jacket people. And so the damage has been done. There's nothing we can do to turn back the time and undo the damage. So in economic terms, this is called a sunk cost, okay? It's like fretting over something that has already happened before that you can't change and allowing that to impact your decisions in the future, even though that should not be something that impacts your decisions in the future. So to throw away a leather jacket that's already bought, um, that's like secondhand or whatever, I think would actually cause more damage. If you look at things from, from that day forward, it's like throwing that away is going to cause more damage because it's gonna cause more environmental impact because instead of buying that, maybe you're gonna buy a brand new jacket that might be, you know, fake leather, but that, you know, uses up resources to make something like that, you know? So I'm all for second hands. I think second hand is, is something that we should all talk about too, whether it's leather or not, whether it's vegan clothing or not. I try, I try my best to buy more secondhand stuff because there's so much going to waste, guys. There's so much that we're wasting every day. I just don't even know where all of our waste is going. I honestly have no idea. How big is this earth? I have no idea where everything is. You know, where is all of our trash? Where is all of our thrown away items? Oh, it amazes me, I don't know. Who? how does this world run? I don't understand. I did not expect to have such an in-depth discussion today. But man, we covered a lot of topics. A lot of topics. Oh, that was fun. I'm glad we got to chat. Sometimes it's nice to be a bit spontaneous and not really have a plan as to what I'm gonna say. Because let me tell you, I did not have any plans to talk about any of the things that I did. It just kind of came to my mind. These things just came to my mind as I went. And um, I'm glad that we got to have a good chat. But I am so full, guys. I <sighs> That was a big meal. That was basically two meals in one. So, great job, Rose. <laughs> I don't know who gave me this ability to eat so much. Well, there you go. Huh, I can't believe I finished all that food. That was a lot of, actually, I can't believe it. I don't know why I always say that. I'm like, oh, I don't think I can finish all of that. And then I finish it all, okay? So 
Uh, yeah, that was so delicious though. I just could not stop. That was just so good. If you guys are interested in Asian vegan cuisine, just letting you guys know, in case you don't know, I am working on an Asian vegan recipes ebook. I'm going to have lots of different Asian and Asian fusion style dishes in the ebook. So if you guys want updates on the ebook and also get some regular updates from me into your inbox, join my mailing list. The link is down below. I'm hoping to get that ebook out in the next two months or so. There's so much going on, but I'm really, really, really working hard on it. So hope you guys are excited because I'm so excited for you guys to see some of these recipes. Anyways, if you enjoy mukbang videos and if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe because I have new mukbang videos coming out every single Monday as part of Munching Mondays. And of course, if you enjoy vegan content in general, you can also subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, do not forget to give it a big thumbs up. I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!